So these were not particularly courageous people. Peter spent the entire night of Jesus' arrest uh, denying him. A servant girl comes to him and says, yeah, you were one of Jesus' disciples, weren't you? But, you know, I should dial 9-11, you know. We've got another one here, you know. And then he said, you know, I, I never knew the person. Sure you knew him. You're one of the, look, you look, you have a Galilean accent. You think you're not one of the disciples? Of course you knew him. And he begins to invoke a curse on himself and says, God do so to me and more also if I ever met the man. Spends the entire night denying his Lord. So this is the apostles. This uh, class act of, of apostolic people, no courage. And yet, and yet, a month after all of this went down, a month after the, the crucifixion, these same apostles are standing up to the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, the very people who... Uh, uh, had Jesus condemned and handed over to the Romans to be, to be crucified and defying them in the name of Jesus. They had the apostles flogged and they said, you shut up about this Jesus of Nazareth stuff. And then they continued to keep on preaching and they hauled them back into court and said, we told you to shut up. And Peter and John said, so whether we should obey you instead of God, I guess you can figure that out for yourself. But as for us, we cannot keep saying and witnessing of what we have seen and heard about the risen Jesus. And all of them eventually paid the price for their defiance, their courage, and their witness with their lives. So the question is, what made the change in the lives of the apostles? It becomes even more mysterious when you're talking about the witness of, of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, thought that Jesus was a blasphemer, a deceiver, a deluded man, a demon-possessed man. You know, the Jewish Sanhedrin never did a better thing than, than when they had him condemned and handed him handed over to the Romans to be, be, be crucified. And he was uh, involved in all of these raids on the Christian assemblies. And he was uh, hounding the, the Christians to death, handing them over. It was hounding them, even the people that would beat it from Palestine to Damascus north, which is to say when they skipped the country. He, he was going to Damascus to have them arrested and bring them bound for a trial. So he goes to Damascus to find these wretched Christians. And when he gets into Damascus, he goes into the synagogue and says, Jesus of Nazareth is Mashiach. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And they said Beg your pardon? What, what, you, what? What has gotten into you? And he said, on the way to Damascus, Jesus of Nazareth revealed himself to me. He is the Messiah. He is the risen Lord. And oddly enough, what all of those wretched Christians were saying turns out to be true. If Jesus was not the risen Son of God, then you have to explain what happened to change the apostles from people who are scared rabbits to those who had the boldness of lions. If it was not the resurrection, then what? That's the first historical item. Second is the witness of the empty tomb. The apostles were proclaiming all of these wonders to the Sanhedrin about a quarter mile or so from the tomb in which Jesus of Nazareth had been buried. And it was the empty tomb and they, he would, they were proclaiming to all and sundry, Jesus of Nazareth has been raised from the dead. We ate and drank with him after the resurrection. If you don't believe it, go check out the tomb for yourself. It was indeed empty. And, this, and all of the authorities could have brought the Christian movement to a screaming halt simply by wheeling in the corpse of Jesus of Nazareth and saying, he's not risen from the dead, he's right here, go check for yourself. They didn't do that. They threatened them, they intimidated them, they bullied them, but they did not bring in the body because they did not have the body. And the official story produced by the authorities of that time is that the apostles stole the body from the tomb while the Roman guards guarding the tomb were, as were asleep. That's their story, and they were sticking to it. So let's kind of look at the story a little bit. We, we recall that the, that the apostles, not exactly uh, paragons of courage, were, having, were hiding, cowering behind locked doors. So the story is that after they finished cowering behind locked doors, they decided that they would go and steal the body, and the Roman guards that were guarding the tomb, they were all asleep. Not one of them dozed off. No, no, they all dozed off. You gotta understand, Roman soldiers did not doze off while they were on guard duty. If you dozed off on guard duty, you were executed on the spot. Rome was funny about that. So, no, no, so you can imagine that there was all sorts of incentive not to doze off, you know? Sleep on your own time. No, no, so not one of them dozed off. They all dozed off. And they all dozed off in such a sound sleep 
that they didn't even awaken when the apostles kind of tippy-toed over their sleeping forms and moved this tremendous stone uh, across there. And then the apostles, having moved this stone with a tremendous noise, effort, exertion, and lots of grunting, still didn't wake up. They go into the body and they say, I know, let's undress the body. Yeah. So they undress the body, and then they fold up the garments neatly in place, and fold it up here, and then haul out the naked body back. Meanwhile, the soldiers are still sleeping the sleep of the just, you know, and, the, that's, and, and they never woke up. This is, this is more unbelievable than the resurrection. And the story that they say is, the apostles stole the body while we were asleep. By anybody's figuring, it's the height of stupidity. If you were asleep, how did you know that it was the apostles? Just for start. You're going to stick by the story, are you? Yes, they are. Okay, so the question there is, what are the options? The, the Jewish authorities did not have the body because they did not produce the body. The Romans did not, did, not, did, not, did not have the body or the body would have been produced. Are you really suggesting that the apostles stole the body in the way that I'm, that I'm suggesting? Okay, so if all of those scenarios are clearly incredible, you're left. With, the, ex with the, the only plausible alternative is that the body was not in the tomb because God raised his son from the dead and he stepped out of the tomb and that story that the apostles, all of them told at the cost of their lives was actually true. That's the second historical piece. The third his his historical piece has to do with the spread of Jewish monotheism throughout all of the world. If you go back into the writings of the Old Testament, going to, say, the, the prophet David, for example, in 900 BC or so, he was writing in his poetry, and the prophets were writing in their poetry for the hundreds of years afterwards, that one day all of the Gentiles, all of the nations throughout all of the world would worship Yahweh, the tribal god of the Jewish people. And they were saying that they were they were not just saying that and wouldn't it be nice? You know, no, no. They were saying eventually all of the world will worship our God, Yahweh, the one and true God. Now you've got to understand Yahweh was not one of the major players. If you wanted to say who's likely to be worshipped uh, to uh, three thousand years later, maybe one of the gods of the superpowers like Assyria or Egypt uh, or Babylon or something like this. Israel was not a, a, a big player. Israel was a, a bit player. If you had, for example, another bit player, like the god of the Ammonites, I think his name is Chemosh. And they're such a bit player, I'm trying to remember, or was that the god of the Moabites? You know, I'm not quite sure. But if you had the god, if, if, if someone said in 900 BC, one day everyone in the world will worship Chemosh, you would say, okay, but that's a, that might be a long shot, you know? That sort of stuff. And the, the very memory of Chemosh has, has vanished. If you talk about the Ammonites, you have to say, who are the Ammonites? You, know, you don't even know. They're all of the people have vanished. And yet, it's, that it is true that 3,000 years after these prophecies were said, Jewish monotheism is indeed spread throughout all the world. And people from uh, Alaska to Australia, from east to west, you know, even in Langley, uh, thousands of years later, are still worshipping the tribal god of the Jews. How does that take place? It took place through the proclamation of the name of Jesus. The apostles proclaimed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, and through their miracles and through their witness and through their quality of, of their lives, people from Australia uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to Alaska and everywhere in between came to worship Jesus and the God of the Jewish people. They came to worship the tribal God, Yahweh, the creator of the heaven and earth, God the Father Almighty. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, then you explain how the tribal God of the Jews came to be worshipped by all the, the Gentiles throughout all of the world. Needs explaining. So when you put all of these things together, what does it mean? It means that in the first century, when the presence of Jesus of Nazareth, something greater than Jonah was there. It means that something greater than Solomon was there. In the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter from Galilee, you had the presence of the God's Messiah himself. Not just another teacher like Gandhi or Buddha, but the son of the living God. The one who was crucified under Pontius Pilate for our sins and raised triumphantly from the dead to be the savior of Jews and Gentiles alike. All will come to him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.